lines of what we normally teach. Um, in fact, it's going to take me several classes to really get us to the place. But, um, you know, barring just somebody being so close to the Lord that they're, you know, almost a stump, um, I think that when you see what this is really about, I think it's really going to bless you and really, really be an incredible thing for you. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, we're in the book of Revelation. This is class number two. <clears throat> um, one thing you have to keep in mind, because before I say that, the book of Revelation for most of us is so strange and weird that um, you have to keep in mind that John wrote it. That was the youngest guy and he was the closest. He was the one who leaned on Jesus's heart. He was, you know, he, he had a real heart for the Lord. This was not, <clears throat> this was not some wild-eyed you know, Ezekiel or, you know, and I'm just, I know, I know Ezekiel wasn't that either, but I'm just saying that's kind of the way we look at Ezekiel too, you know, ah, crazy prophet is seeing weird things from God. <clears throat> this is John. This was the youngest of the ones. And, 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 and to help uh, temper that, you got to remember that this guy wrote um, four other books besides the book of Revelation that we read in our Bible. Matthew, no, 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 no. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And then that goes right into the book of Revelation. All right, so um, you, um, to, to really understand the book of Revelation, it helps to understand the Gospel and the, and the writings of John. Okay, I'm giving you a few little hints here. That this guy's not as weird and as far off as you think. He's, he's actually pretty steady here. In fact, let's, let's go so that we can just sort of set this up. Let's go to first to the Gospel of John. We're only going to look at a couple of verses there. Gospel of John chapter 1. Now, uh, well, let's just read uh, the first three verses. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. <clears throat> And we can read half of the next verse too, verse 4. In him was life. In him was life. All right. Um, the first thing to notice from what John was writing is that John was getting, in the book of Revelation now, in the scriptures we've already read, John was getting, kept getting this thing from Jesus. It's like he's hearing from the living Lord and what keeps coming is that, that he's Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's, he's, it just keeps coming on this thing of, of uh, the beginning and the end. The first and then the very last. You, you see what I mean? The alpha and then the omega. Well, folks, he starts this one within the beginning. You see that? And you can be assured in God. Shay and I were talking about this a little bit in Arkansas. If I could reach a piece of chalk, I got it. The beginning. <laughs> This line goes all the way through me. In the beginning, I'm a crippled man. The beginning, if the Lord is the beginning, the, then the end is going to be governed by who the beginning is. 
Okay? Is that right or wrong? I mean, if he's the beginning and the end, or the and the ending, then what, and listen carefully, think of the book of Revelation, then what we find in the end, or what we find in the ending, is going to be governed by who this person is in the beginning. Whatever he was in the beginning. Okay, well, this is, this is going to help us even though <clears throat> there's certain things I want you to focus on. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Okay, in the beginning, there's a beginning that is not creation. Creation doesn't start till verse 3. The beginning starts in verse 1. Look at it again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then there, this beginning, this one that is Christ, all things were flung into existence by Him. So the true beginning is not the beginning of creation. It is him who always was, who was, here's another one that he used. And see, John is, John is captivated by this reality. He, he sticks with this through the gospel. He sticks with this through his epistles. He is captivated by this beginning and end thing. And that's one reason why the book of Revelation was handed, I'm just going to say it like this, handed to you, dear brother, I can see Jesus saying to John, you, because you have studied what the beginning is, and therefore, you'll understand the end. Because the beginning and the end are the same, but they look different. They look different. They're, they're going to look different. The, take for an example... Um, uh, I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians 15 now, but I'm not going to turn there and take our time up with that. But he, he starts talking about there's you know, different kind of seeds and different kind of stars and different kind of stuff like, like that. And, and a seed, if you take a seed and you put that seed into the ground and it dies, you see it in one form there and then you see an ending, but then you see a new beginning where the plant begins to grow. But when the plant grows, and when it begins to bring forth fruit, the fruit, you could say, the, the, the uh, farmer would say, the fruit is the end of the harvest, would he not? Okay, well, the fruit comes forth from the seed that died. You understand? It's, it's all one. It's all one. The seed all the way down to the result of the seed. But a seed in the beginning looks very different than the ending. But how are you going to know the ending if you don't know the, the beginning? And so John, now John has seen something on this line and he is really, really caught up in it because he's, he's beginning to evaluate things based on this beginning and this ending. All right, so now let's go over to uh, 1 John. The epistle of 1 John. And the first chapter. All right. 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning. Oh my gosh, folks. In the first verse of what he has written in epistle form or gospel form, he's got the word beginning within the first verse, within the first five, verse, uh, five words, he is pointing to the beginning. Now, this is, uh, again, something for some of you who have not been in my... How many of you have been in my Gospel of John class? Raise your hand. Okay. So that was your first two years of Bible school right there. <laughs> um, uh, what I shared there was if you go through the uh, beginning verses that talk about like Mark and Matthew and Luke and John and you compare where they start, like Mark starts with John the Baptist. That's his beginning. And... 
uh, Matthew starts with the birth of Jesus. That's his beginning and so on and so forth. But John, his beginning was all the way back, all the way to when the whole thing was created in the heart of God, meaning how about conceived in the heart of God before the creation that caused the creation, that birthed the creation, the beginning birthed the creation. Okay, so this is, this, see, John, that's why I'm saying that John has genuinely gotten out of the temporal realm. And he has gotten into the eternal. And when he, in his heart, and again, remember, this is the guy who laid his head on Jesus' bosom during the, the Lord's Supper. And John, somewhere in his heart, said, I want to, you know, he was right there with Jesus. He saw the miracles. He saw the healings. He saw all of the great stuff that was going on. But he said, if this is the eternal one, if this guy right here, if Jesus is the eternal one, he's got to be more than when he showed up 30 years ago. Can you see that? It's got, he's got to be much more than that. That can't be the beginning. So he, he, he laid his head on that bosom and he listened to that heart of Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm using that colloquially. He laid his head there. I want to hear your heart. I don't want to just think about the, the um, uh, events that have transpired during my lifetime. For God's sake, I hope he's more than that and the things that he's just done in your life. And so he's, so in, the, in his gospel, he says, in the beginning was the word which was before creation, verse three. But here he says, that which was from the beginning, we have, let's read it now. That which was, this is 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. We have heard what? He's not saying we heard Jesus of Nazareth. We've heard him that was from the beginning. This is an eternal reality that has been coming to us, and uh, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. He's, he's not talking about in the beginning was the book. He says, this is the word of life. This is, and in that, in that word of life is Alpha and Omega. And as Nisi said in the last class, and everything that that could write out, everything it could spell, everything that you could conceive by ordering those in any possible order, he's the word of life. He's the word of life. He's not just a book. He's not ink on white paper. Right. Say, well, praise God, I, I've been in the word today. No, you honestly, you've been in the scripture. <clears throat> I know when we used to have a, have the church over on Bolivar and Pam Gentry was the secretary, I'd, I'd say, well, I'm going to go home and get in the Word. I said, I, I renamed my bed the Word. <laughs> I gave it a name. I said, well, I'm going to go get in the Word. <clears throat> but the Word, as John said, was made flesh. Oh, my God, do you understand that that was, the, it's not the flesh. Why do we only see to the point where he was born or to the point where, um, like I said, Mark starts his ministry, where Jesus starts? That's the beginning. The beginning is when he started his ministry. No, sir. He was way further. John just goes, and he says, that's what we were in contact with. That was it. That's what we handled. That's what we were looking at. The word of life. Okay. All right. This guy wrote the book of Revelation. This guy understands beginning and understands end. And so he's writing the gospel, the gospel for, you know, as, as far as Christianity is concerned. Okay, the gospel, you read the gospel, that's the beginning. That's when you get saved, okay? John wrote one of them. But he also wrote the book of Revelation. And 
whatever he saw in the gospel or in his epistles in terms of him who was before everything created and as the beginning, since Jesus is the beginning and the end, whatever he was in the beginning, he's going to be in that book of Revelation. Do you understand? That's important because the first verse, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the book of Revelation, not the book of the revelation of horrible times or the book of the revelation of, of, of uh, worldwide calamity. The book of the revelation of Christ. John saw this guy. And he wrote of him in his gospel. And he wrote of him in 1 John. And if you can comprehend his writings there, guess what? Revelation isn't hard. It's the, same, it's the same way he received Christ in those books. God just, but again, it's like a seed as opposed to a tree with fruit. They look very different. But they're the same. They're the same. And you have to look past the leaves and you have to look past the fruit and you have to look even past the branches to fully grasp what this end is. You see that? That's what John has done. And that's why God said, John, you're going to write, you're going to write the end because you know him who was the beginning and the end. You're going to do that. All right. So for me... Um, this started setting the groundwork for the book of Revelation then. Well, if this is this, you know, I, I, I'm going to just give you my little fairy tale view of John. You know, he's a young guy. Of course, by the time he wrote this, he was way older than me. Way older. I think he was in his 90s or something. Yeah, you know. But, you know, I'm just telling you my fairy tale view. You know, he's this young kid. He's this guy that loves the Lord. He's the guy that's running with Peter to the tomb. He's the guy that's laying his head on Jesus' bosom. He just, he's, 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 the, he's there at the cross. None of the other disciples are there. He's at the cross. He's hugging Jesus' mom. He's looking at Jesus on the cross. He's not running away and hiding. And, and he's got uh, this heart to know the Lord beyond the surface, and he's just dedicated his being to that, and God is fulfilling his heart's desire. Praise God. And so, I mean, I can't imagine what we think he went through when God started showing him the book of Revelation, but I think to him it was a continued picture of what he'd already seen of Jesus, the revelation of Christ. I think it was a continued outflow, but now this is, this is the end. This is how it ends, but not prophetically. Not, and I'm not saying it's not a prophetic book and there couldn't be prophetic implications. I'm saying from John's point of view, the beginning and the end are the same. That's a key. And if you don't understand that, and, and remember now, remember how many scriptures we went through? We went, like first class, this is just two. We went through a lot of scriptures from in the very first chapter where Jesus is constantly saying, Alpha, Omega, beginning and the end, first and the last, him that was, is, and is to come. Him that was, is, and you just open in the first chapter of the book, guess what is to come? but still not in the way that we, ha we would teach um, you know, Ephesians. No, because his purpose, he's got, he's, he's got a purpose, and he's got this purpose because he's a 96-year-old, uh, however old he is, um, uh, pastor. Because they, history says that he pastored the Ephesus church. Okay, that's not, we don't have that in the Bible, but history says that that's what he was and they, they didn't like what he was doing so then they 
exiled him onto the island of Patmos, and that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. All right. <clears throat> so, um, so he's starting with the beginning in the Gospel of John and in First John, um, and then. Uh, I, I, I want you to notice something now. I, I mean, I, I think the Holy Spirit has allowed me to set this stage pretty well for you to see John, his comprehension of the beginning and the end and how that's fulfilled in Christ and how it's not what we think the revelation is. Okay. Now look at chapter 2, uh, 1 John 2. In verse 18, okay, I, before we read it, I want you to be aware of particular words in this verse, okay? When we read it, I want you to notice them, but not until, until we read it, so don't look yet. Uh, I want you to notice last time or the last days, last time, I want you to notice the word Antichrist comes. And I want you to notice the word now is, okay? 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many, many Antichrists by which we know that it is the last time. All right. If somebody talks to you about the Antichrist, what point in time do you think? End times. Well, he's talking about the end times right here, but he's talking about now. Right? If somebody talks to you about the end time, when do you think of? The book of Revelation. All right. When John thinks of the end times, he thinks of two things. He thinks of Jesus being the beginning and the end. And he does, his heart is not divided on that issue. His heart is not divided. He's not double-minded. He thinks of Jesus first and foremost. And Jesus, you know, we read Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus himself said over and over to him, I am. He didn't say I do or I will, he said I am. Alpha and Omega. It's the first thing he thinks of. The second thing that he thinks of as the last days or the end time is the cross. And he thinks of that because in his mind, we'll see this. So I'm just laying this out now for you to, to hold and to consider. <clears throat> he thinks that the judgment, that the judgment day was the day Jesus slaughtered the old man, the old creation at the cross. That the cross did away with the old nature. It did away with the flesh. Uh, what did uh, Paul say in uh, Galatians uh, 5.24? Um, that the flesh is crucified. What did he say in 6.14? The world is crucified, and I unto the world. What did he say in 2.20? I am crucified with Christ. He sees, okay, and we're just talking about John here. He sees judgment day like an atomic bomb that went off at the cross that decimated everything of the old creation. <laughs> I mean, that's how he sees it, Okay. And he sees that anybody who lives now, you look back to the cross and you see yourself crucified there. 
There you see I am. Not I was, but I still am crucified with Christ. I am. And there he sees all, and, and listen to this one. This is real important, especially all you young people. He sees all the punishment for everything that anyone ever did wrong coming down on Jesus, coming down on Jesus so that it is paid for. Okay. Well, what do I mean by that? The end time has already come in this sense. Now, again, this is not the whole of what I'm going to be teaching. This isn't even, this isn't really even the main direction. So if you're wondering, no, I mean, I'm just being honest with you. you. You know, we're going to get into some great stuff. But this has to be laid. John sees that if Jesus bore all of our punishment that if you did something wrong he's not going to punish you for it. He'll chastise you as a son meaning as a family member but he's not going to punish you because Jesus already bore that. He will not treat you like a sinner who needs to be punished. He will treat you like a family member, like a son, like as if Christ is your life. <laughs> and you will just be chastised to bring you back into the full reality of who and what you are. All right. Now I say that, and I'm sure we all say amen and oh, that's really good. But how many of us, when we get out there and we mess up and we go, oh boy, something bad's going to happen now because of what I did? Anybody ever thought that? Well, don't tell me you understand this if that's what you're thinking because this is not theology. This is the destruction of not just all of, of the fallen race of Adam. This is the destruction and judgment upon all sins and all punishment borne by one so that you never have to worry walking around with fear hanging over your head thinking, well, you know, I guess because I'm not really doing this or I'm not da 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 that God is going to get me or because I did so and so. He's not going to punish you. He is not. The punishment has been borne. He will chastise you to bring you to bring you back into his heart and in his reality. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Folks, when he punishes, if you read the Old Testament, when he punishes, he's upset enough to destroy and does. You know, think of the Korah's rebellion and the earth opening up, swallowing them straight into hell. That's not gonna happen to you, but you have to, you have to walk in the judgment. You have to walk in the full understanding that that cross was like an atomic bomb that wiped out everything but Christ. Amen. Jesus said, I am he that liveth and am alive forevermore. Okay? Well, where does he live? In his body. Where does Jesus live? Where's his body? Right here, I'm looking at it. It's his body. It's, it's where he lives. You know, he doesn't sleep up here on the stage at night. Well, I live in the church. This is not the church. It's just a building. We're the church. He lives in us. He's, he doesn't hang out, you know. Well, I was walking down the road and I saw Jesus. Well, I don't, I don't think so. He's in you. Besides, what would be greater? I mean, I remember, I remember one time, you know, the Lord, this was early in my walk with the Lord, and he was beginning to reveal the reality that Christ is my life and that Christ was in me and that that was the plan of God. I was still new at it and, you know, had times of, of shifting and whatever. And I went to this church service with some friends. And we were sitting in there, 
And this brother said, uh, he walked up to the stage from out in the audience and he said, I've just had a vision of Jesus. He says, I saw Jesus standing right over there. And, you know, everybody went, oh, you know. And I kind of went, oh, and then I went, wait a minute. Which is greater for him to be over there or him to be in here? I mean, come on, let's get real now. Let's not play games with this. Either, the, either it's the truth or it's not the truth. And if it's the truth, then, uh, you know, and Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ standing over there is, you know, I don't know. What? Just Christ over there. You know, and really, honestly, Christ over there doesn't do you any good. Christ in you as your nature, as your life, that's what's going to do you some eternal good. Okay? But see... The only way you're going to see Christ over there and glory in it is if you didn't get devastated by the judgment. All right. All right, but that, again, all this isn't my point, nor is it even the train that we're going to ride to get where we're going. The train we're going to get on is not near as clunky. It's going to be smooth once we, once we get these tracks laid a little better. All right. Um, so in verse 18, little children, it is the last time. Well, I looked it up and one of the translations for this right here says, it is the last hour. All right. Well, there's several things that went through my little mind. And it's a little bitty mind in there, but a couple, several things went through my mind. It's the last hour. I thought, you know, being the last time, and being the last hour is two different things. If it's the last time, you, you might have weeks or months or years. The last hour is, dang, it's, it's here. <laughs> you know? But the other thing that came to my mind was John 12, 23. It says, uh, verily, verily, uh, 23 and 24, the Hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and died about it alone. Okay. <clears throat> Couple of things there. The hour, the hour, the last hour for Jesus was the cross. The, so can we say the last time? For Jesus was the cross. It was. On this earth, other than in us, that was it. Okay? Well, guess what? If, if our old man is crucified with Christ, if we're crucified, if we're crucified under the world, if, you know, we're crucified, uh, uh, have crucified the flesh with the affection of lust, like that we just keep going through the scriptures you know for ye are dead and, and your life is hid with Christ if you just keep going through all of those scriptures that say that you come to one reality the last hour wasn't just Jesus's last hour it was ours okay it was ours so that was the last time okay let's read again little children it is the last hour And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. And even now are there many Antichrists by which we know that it is the last time. Now, John wrote that 2,000 years ago. So either he missed it thinking that it was the last. Anybody following this? He missed it thinking that that was the last days. Or... Uh, they missed it when, when Hitler was in charge and running over countries and stuff and said, well, that's the Antichrist and this is the last days. Or you go back to, you know what I mean? You just keep going back or you, you know, uh, or you listen to everyone. Else. Well, this is the last days. You know, folks, I was, I was young when I started out and I thought I was in the last days. Okay? Well, guess what? I was right. And so were they. And so was everyone along the way. But the last time is the cross. 
they, you know, if you'd wake up, you know, and I say that uh, knowing the Holy Spirit has to wake us up to this, and it's not wake up to what I'm teaching. If it's true, that's what our hearts should cry out. Lord, if this is true, I need, I need to enter into the last days, the last hour, and I need to come into that. <clears throat> and then uh, verse 17, and the world passeth away and the lust of it, but he that doeth the will of the Lord abideth forever. Okay, so the, so the world's passing away by this last hour, by this judgment, by the cross. It's passing away where? In your life. Again, Galatians 6, 14. I am crucified unto the world and the world unto me. How do you defeat the world? Well, you just, you know, you don't, you don't get on Amazon.com or, or eBay. That's how you defeat the world. No. You didn't defeat the world in you. You just you just shut it down for a while, but it'll pop out. It's like a it's like you know a a, a a teapot on the stove, and the fire is going, and the lid's on it, and it's going. You know, well, you know, if you had the lid off of it, it's not so bad. You put the lid on there and try to shut it off. Can I get a oh me? You try to shut it off, you just made it worse. Romans 7 says that. Okay? That's not the answer. The answer is not shut it off. The answer is shut you off. It's called the cross. <laughs> you know? I am crucified to the world. That's what he said. That's, that's what John saw. Now, I'm going to tell you that the things that I've shared in this class so far that's not where we're going, nor is it the theme of how we're going to get there. But if you don't have some of these things under your belt, you're, go it's, you're not going to be grasping everything. All right? All right. So um, the world is passing away and the lust of it. And notice how it says that uh, the world passes away and the lust of it. Oh, really? Really? In John's day, you're just standing there, and he goes, well, look at there. The world is passing away, and look, the lust of it. It's all, I think it's less. Now, Jesus, there it goes, that's right. <laughs> when Jesus said it would get worse and worse. Well, what's right, John or Jesus? Well, Jesus, because it's gotten worse and worse. But John was right, too. In his view of the end time, in his view of the last hour, the world is passing away. And so is the lust of it. And then notice the wording, but he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. Now what is that talking about? The will of God here is in relationship to the cross. It is, it is, it is. All right. I'm a, and, and here's what I'm doing. I'm only sharing this part of it to just try to communicate a little bit of his mind out of his other writings. Okay. So that you can begin to see this guy has a view that is not just based on what God can do for me now. He has an eternal view of what has been accomplished and what will empower you when you embrace certain realities that are eternal, okay? That, that'll usher you into the book of Revelation, into a door that you're, you're willing to go through, okay? <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, I wrote down in my notes, he does not change when he gets to the last book. John doesn't change when he gets to the last book, the book of Revelation. It's the same view, but now the book of Revelation is shrouded with other pictures that are unfamiliar. Okay, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about there. You can, you can attend uh, church here or Bible school, uh, and as you do, um, you get familiar with the terminology. And if you've never really heard anybody else teach this, then you really cling to the terminology here 
because it's more familiar to you. Oh, well, when he says that, when he says the finished work, I, oh, amen, you know what I mean? And we get familiar with it. But you go visit another place, and they, maybe they're, they're sharing exactly the same thing, but they got different terminology. Then what do we do? I'll tell you what many people do. They shut them down. They go, well, that ain't right. Or, you know, what, what does he mean by that? You know, that can't be right. He, he ought to say it the way we say it, you know. No, 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 no. There's, there's an eternal thread that's running through all of this. And you have to get past the terminology. And you have to get past the surface. And you have to say, Lord, is this you? Is this your son? Is this? And, and uh, it takes a while to learn new terminology. But it doesn't take a while to hear the Holy Spirit who said that that bears witness. This is, this is along the same lines we're, we're sharing. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and so um, the same thing with Gospel of John, Book of Revelation. It's like somebody changed up the terminology on us. But listen. Listen. Because there it is. The same living word. Remember? Remember what he said of the word, that which was from the beginning, we have handled here in the middle. That's also going to be what manifests in the end. And the manifestation is a powerful thing in the end. It looks different than the beginning seed, but it is, it is every bit as powerful. <clears throat> All right. So um, let's see one final scripture, even though we didn't get our full meal deal here. Let's go to Isaiah 46. And um, I want to tell you that Isaiah and John are buds. They're buddies. They are, they are kindred spirits in comprehending the beginning and the end. Now, I got a challenge for you. This would require you doing something outside of just sitting here and listening, sleeping. And that is either get your concordance or <clears throat> somehow go look up how many times Isaiah talks about the beginning and the end. If you just started with looking up the word the beginning and the Strong's concordance. You'd be shocked. Isaiah has comprehended not just the same thing, but like from the same terminology, the same view. He's, he sees it, and John may have got it from Isaiah, you know, because Isaiah keeps referring to it. And, and uh, the, only way to, the only way to convince you, honestly, like I have, a, I have a cell phone and I've got a little search thing on it. And I can put like the beginning or beginning in it and then hit and it'll bring up all the scriptures. And I'll say Old Testament it brings up all the scriptures in the Old Testament that has it. And in fact, I did that and went, oh my God, he's talking about the beginning. In the, whoa, he, whoa. And I just kept going. This is amazing. And Isaiah's up there in that great cloud of witnesses going, yeah, go, John, go. You know, write about the eternal, not just the guy that started when he started his ministry, the guy that started at his birth. Or Luke takes it all the way back to Abraham. There's the beginning. No, that was the beginning for Luke. John saw that that beginning was outside of time. And once he comprehended that, then he has to say, oh, you're gonna have to show me what that means in terms of reality to my being. All right, Isaiah 46 and verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning. Where are you getting the end? From the beginning. It goes backwards and forwards. This is a, this is a, a sliding scale that the beginning, and this is one of the things that Isaiah is saying a lot, that the, that the, in, that the end is found in the beginning. 
And here's what he says a whole lot. He says, he's quoting God. This is God speaking through Isaiah. He says, you already know this. We've told you this from the beginning. Well, didn't John say that in 1 John? That, that from the beginning, this was a commandment that was from the beginning, da, 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 and all this stuff. And you know it. But do we know it? Maybe we know the terminology. But I don't want to know the terminology. I want to know. See, I don't even. Here's what I started with this when our very first class. I want to look at Jesus way over here in the beginning before there was a creation when, when the beginning began in his heart and the Father's heart and the Holy Spirit and they, then they you know, started creation. I want to look there and I don't want to put a label or name on him. I just want to call him beginning. You are the beginning and the end. How shall I know the end? Well, you shall know the uh, declaring the end from the beginning. So I can know you by knowing the beginning, I'll know the end. It'll manifest different, but if I can stay in the spirit and not just the mental concepts of labels and, you know, he's the Christ and he's king of kings and no, no, who are you, Mr. Beginning? Holy Spirit, see, and that's what I do. I grab my friend, the Holy Spirit, I pull him over and I point to it. And I say, I don't know that. And, and Jesus said, you were going to guide me into all truth. And you are my teacher. And I can't know anything apart from you. you. You're the Holy Spirit. You are the only one because you knew Jesus before all of this stuff. See, because Jesus was somebody before all this stuff. Before there was a need for healing. Well, who was he? He wasn't the healer. Before there was a need for deliverance. Who was he? And he was somebody. But that somebody was eternal. That somebody was and is right now and is to come. That book of Revelation is what it's all about. How will you know the beginning? Look at the end. How will you know the end? Look at the beginning. And from that... <clears throat> From that, um, God begins to take things of the material realm, like the book of Revelation or the Gospel of John. He puts it in a setting. The Gospel of John is nothing but putting him that is from the beginning or the Alpha and the Omega in a setting. If we only see the setting, we've missed what's going on. The book of Revelation is him who is the end and the ending in a setting. It's in a setting. It's in a different setting than the beginning setting. That setting is what's going to explode the reality of who he is in the first chapter of who he keeps declaring himself to be. All right, any questions or thought before we close out? All right, let me say this. The next class we're going to, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through Revelation chapter 2 and 3. So it would be good if you could read that before next Thursday. Just a refresher. Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. Let's just make it that. What we're going to examine is each of these seven churches in light of three different things. One is... What is, the, what is this, these seven churches individually? What is the specific thing that they are assailed by, by outsiders? Okay, number two. What, I'll just say, what is their inward problems? Uh, I, I put it as... Um, 
they have what kind of problems? What is their inward problem that the Lord wants to deal with that has nothing to do with the outsiders that are causing problems? And then the final answer is, or, or the final thing is, what is the answer? And that's the, that'll be the easiest one because the, he gives them all the same exact words as the answer. Okay. So now to do that, to do what I just described <clears throat> is still only laying groundwork. Once we get through that, let me make sure. Yeah. Once we get through that, I will begin to really start telling you the, you know, the train we're going to get on. And it's different than this bumpy one up to this point. But you have to see that this book was written to the seven churches. And, and we'll, we'll explain that. But you have to see that, and that's why we need to examine these seven churches. And we need to see what's going on and what the Lord's saying is the deal. And then watch him develop it for the rest of the book. So that's where we're headed. Father, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit. He's our teacher and our guide, and we know nothing apart from him. We are blind. Uh, we are deaf. Um, but you are, you are almighty. You can open our eyes. You can open our ears spiritually. And so, Lord, I pray that the words that I share will be spirit and will be life. And, and even though at this point in this stage, they are simply setting the stage and are not even, not even arranged fully that they will go into our hearts and will become um, pavement stones for what's coming so that we might enter into a whole new understanding of where the book of Revelation came from and why and what is really trying to communicate. Open our hearts. Make us willing. And Lord, where, where we feel hard and unable to come, where we feel uh, stuck, then we turn to you as the Almighty. And we say, help us get to him that was and is and is to come. Do a miracle, do, a, do whatever it takes to bring us, but our hearts say yes, even if our soul is afraid. May we hear the words of Jesus as he says, fear not, I am he that was dead and am alive forevermore. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.